My name is Chris Regini, and I've been a STEAM educator at West Hollow Middle School for the better part of 14 years. And it's really only been over the last five or so that I've recognized that the educational system that we are operating within is in desperate need of a paradigm shift. And I'm going to start by taking a look at a picture of my classroom. And within it, we have fantastic access to tech. And it really does give the kids an awesome opportunity at realizing themselves as being makers. But if you were to walk in cold and really take a look at it, it isn't going to look a whole lot different than it did in the 1910s and 20s, when the model was to prepare a fleet of people who were capable of repeating tasks and operating within this really strict social hierarchy. So to avoid that, people have begun redesigning rooms and throwing a bunch of technology in there. And superficially, that looks fantastic. It's pretty. There's lots of colors. There's technology on the walls, everything. But I still see this. I still see a room that's set up to put a bunch of people in front of an orator at the front who's just there to distribute information. Now, they might be distributing it in a slightly more high-tech way, and it might be recorded in a more efficient manner, but there's no engagement. So the mistake a lot of us make when we are purchasing ed tech or when we're looking for it or we're even using it is we end up living in that bottom enhancement level of the SAMR model where we're really just substituting, right? Notebooks are becoming personal computing devices. Smart boards are replacing chalkboards. Maybe we're augmenting tech, textbooks online with some text-to-speech or some video to watch, but we're not really ascending through Bloom's taxonomy. We're not getting up into the levels where we can modify the tasks and redefine the things that kids should be doing, where they're getting a genuine opportunity to problem-solve and creatively come up with a solution to those problems that actually mean something to them. So I've left that classroom. I've moved into spaces that look more like this where kids can engage, kids can collaborate and talk with one another. Where the emphasis is switched from what the kids know to what the kids can do, to what the kids can make. Now, when those spaces first sh uh, started showing up around our buildings, I often sat in them, eating my lunch and thinking to myself, how am I going to get in here? How am I going to convince administration or the brass that makes the decisions to allow me to take kids into this place? How am I going to improve the test scores and prove to them that these are the types of environments we need? And you know what I realized? I was asking the wrong damn question. I was asking the same questions that I was brainwashed to think were important by the system that I grew up in and that I started my career in. It's not about passing those tests. It's about replacing the tests. It's about giving kids an opportunity to fail. Because it's not until they have that first attempt in learning that they truly end up getting to fix a problem. Go back to the design room and iterate it forward. So instead of just distributing information to our kids, I want to equip them with a tool belt. I want them to be able to choose the tool when they think they need it. Now, it is incumbent upon me to teach them how to use these tools, but I want to leave it up to them to what they want to make with those things. And it still baffles me that in an age, as Bill was mentioning earlier, where information is instantaneously accessible to us, and we have all of human knowledge at our fingertips, that we're still valuing tests where we just regurgitate fact, that we have to somehow add value to a student's experience in school with a number that's circled at the top of a piece of paper. So how do we change that dynamic? Now, a lot of us in the room are probably familiar with Seymour Papert or Mitch Resnick and the idea of cultivating creativity through projects and passion, peers and play. But it's not about reading a book or having a conversation or sitting in a room with like-minded people. It's about diving in and actually trying it out. Jumping in and creating project-based learning. And I kind of love this model of, of Mitch's idea of where the low floors have ramps that make learning accessible to everyone. And that the ceilings are high enough to foster creativity, but we equip it with tall ladders to give them an access point. And we still have reinforced corners that provide the support and the social constructs they need to get there. 
And within those wide walls, we have frames of interest because sometimes a 12-year-old needs a little nudge in the right direction when they're trying to figure out what they're passionate about. Now, every day I stand in front of 135 12 and 13-year-olds as a seventh grade science teacher, and I usually refer to them as my scientists or my minions. But I don't lose sight of the fact that those young people are, art are artists, songwriters, mathematicians, aspiring entrepreneurs and politicians, environmentalists, coders, hackers, engineers. But at the end of the day, what are they really? They're kids. Okay? And we must never lose sight of that fact. That they come from this wide array of backgrounds. And that what's meaningful to them is different in every chair in the room. And the way that they want to show that to you, that's meaningful to them, is as varied as their faces. And then giving them an opportunity to work with their peers to actually grapple with stuff and talk and collaborate and solve problems, even if they don't see those problems the same way. Because these STEAM values that we place so much emphasis on, if those are going to be the bricks upon which we build the foundation of our future, then it's going to be the soft skills that are going to be the mortar. The ability to discuss things and to get your way through stuff when you don't see it eye to eye. Which is why we give our students in our classroom the ability to not just talk with each other, but we kick down the walls of those classrooms. Our students have lab partners on four different continents. And when you talk about growing food with someone in China and Mexico and Finland and Wales, and you understand why certain things are important to them, it gives you this global competency that you just can't replace. And then, of course, there's play. And if you'll indulge me for a moment, this is my four-year-old engineer. And I'm not showing her to you just because I'm an insanely proud dad or because I don't think that engineering offers enough access to young ladies, but because the flexibility that we extend to four-year-olds ought to follow them through their entire educational experience. It shouldn't end when they get to school. It should begin, but somehow it goes away. And before any of you judge that too harshly, that drill does not have a battery, okay? <laughs> so how do we take Mitch Resnick's four Ps and apply them to the actual curriculum, the stuff that we are committed to teaching these kids? And I want to call to attention that right there, because I've heard myself say that out loud. You must know this chemical reaction. Why? Why the heck do you have to know those letters and numbers in that sequence? And what does it actually mean to know that chemical reaction? So I've been grappling with questions just like this. How do I take a varied group of individuals and give them a project that they can collaborate on with their peers in a way that's important to them and still allow them to play? So if we look at photosynthesis, I see it as food. And every human being on Earth, regardless of your social background or your political persuasions, can get their head around sitting at a table and breaking bread with another human being. It's one of our most basic human needs, isn't it? And with a population that is approaching 10 billion people in fast order, we better come up with a way to feed that population. So what food are you going to appreciate any more than the food that comes from the seeds that you've sown with your own bare hands? or the seedlings that you've selected yourself that are going to go into the farm. And by the way, this is a very emotional day for my kids because by now, they've named all the seedlings, and when I tell them they have to cull them from the rock walls, it becomes problematic. And if you want to light a fire inside of a kid's eyes, tell them that they're going to be responsible for designing a vertical hydroponic garden that's going to be capable of growing food in non-traditional environments. Crowded urban cities, the Arctic, the desert, on Mars. Tell a 12-year-old kid that they're a Mars farmer, and there's your passion right there. And then build it with them. And let them watch the food that they have sown grow in a system that they have designed. And then earmark all of those repetitive processes that we're going to hand off to machines, and build the machines. 
and design and wire and code an automation system capable of growing food on another planet. Now, our hands don't get dirty the way a traditional farmer's would. We don't dig them into the soil because hydroponics is completely soilless. But I promise you there is no short order of hands-on experiences. So I'm supposed to relate this back to photosynthesis, right? And the myriad of learners that we're supposed to access. So let's do that. Let's start on the reactant side of photosynthesis. Now you're going to hear me say a lot of names that you'll not know. But I can't help but say out loud because when I see their projects, I see their face. I see that kid who came through and designed and created and made these things. Like Mark, whose understanding of mathematics is intimidating. I have trouble engaging this young man in conversations because I don't know if I know anything when I, saw, when I talk to Mark. So what do you do? You give him a $500 par meter that you could have only afforded to, uh, to borrow and you ask him to map out an algorithm that will pass on its data to a 19 cent photoresistor. And when he draws that equation on the board, you have to take a picture of it with your phone and send it to a colleague you know at Princeton to vet it so that you can actually tell him if he was correct, which he was. <laughs> you take a carbon dioxide sensor and find two musicians in the room who've particularly shown lately that they're really into composing music on Sonic Pi and then ask them to create musical pieces that are happy and sad, and that will only play when you access it through the vocal user interface that they've designed. And when you ask the plant, are you happy or sad today, based on the carbon dioxide levels from their sensor? Now hydroponics, it's all about water, and we have ultrasonic reservoirs that know how full they are, that have been designed by 12 and 13 year old kids that built them when we taught them about volume. Because I could not stand another year of just having them read a graduated cylinder and read the bottom of the meniscus. I just, that's what you're supposed to do, by the way. So, um, but I just, it had to be different. And I had to have a better way of visualizing the data. And so did they. So they hacked the stoplight to tell us how much water is in the res. Now, we're going to have to grow our food in something. We do need some media. And that medium is going to have to be pretty lightweight, because if you think you spend a lot on bags to jump on an airplane, wait till you see NASA's bill. All right? So they've created an array of moisture sensors that pick the best medium, which is the lowest weight and holds on to the most water. And you've got to be OK with when you think you've designed this really awesome system that's growing perfectly and engaging kids on a level that you really were looking for. And Ryan comes up to you and says, that's ah, inefficient. We spent all that time top-watering all of these little things when they were babies. And like, can't we just give that to a machine? So you build the machine. You build a top-watering manifold with Ryan because that's what he saw needed to be put into that system. One of the weird little quirks about hydroponics is you have to really carefully pH your water. Otherwise, your plants don't soak up the nutrients and eat the way that they're supposed to. And in fact, commercial hydroponic farmers have people on staff whose only job is to test and to automate the pH. And we could go out and we could buy that stuff. But how much cooler is it when Nathan builds his own? I mean, that's awesome. Temperature. We've messed around with HVAC insulation and trying to figure out ways for these dark buckets to not let light in but not heat up. And we had to go back to the drawing board where it just wasn't working and hit that prototyping because we were failing over and over again. And then when you watch a group of four middle school kids design this cooling system for the water reservoir, it blows your mind because you realize you would have paid 10 times that amount when you could have just handed it to a kid and say, you make it. And there's nutrients. Yeah, we got to add that. Anybody here who's seen The Martian saw the way Matt Damon went about doing that business and no, we don't go there, all right? And you're probably assuming at this point that we found a way to automate it, and we have, but that's not the fun part of this story. The fun part of this one is when you have Nadia, who's been drawing on basically every piece of paper she can find, every test, every lab she's submitted to you has a piece of her artwork, 
And instead of telling her, stop drawing, pay more attention, you ask her to design a piece of artwork in which you can embed the automation system that now hangs next to our Mar Mar Mars farm and is a symbol of form meeting function. And then even through sharing our experience, you get challenged. Well, Mr. Andrew Webb challenge accepted when he told me that, you know, he's got these plants at MIT that can rotate themselves based on where the light is, said, we could do that. So our design team is currently working on self-rotating plants that avoid tropisms by leaning towards the light when they're sat in the same place for too long. Now let's hop over to the product side. Water, carbon dioxide turns into glucose, glucose turns into more plant, and you gotta account for your yield. So you could put it on a triple beam balance or you can hack a bathroom scale and have it do it for you. Pretty fun when Ryan decided to do that. Or how about taking your environmentalist and your capitalist and having them realize that lowering your energy use is mutually beneficial. While one is looking to lower their carbon footprint, the other is looking to maximize yield per kilowatt hour that they use. They're able to approach the same problem for different angles and come up with a solution that works for both sides. And they realize that sustainability doesn't have to be a red thing or a blue thing. It's just a thing that works for everybody. I'd say Washington could use a little bit of that thinking sometimes. Now, don't forget the fun little failures. Have a dozen pepper plants make and drop flowers for two weeks and try to figure out what about this amazing system is not allowing them to make peppers and have Zach look up and say, Mr. R, there's no bees. <sighs> yeah, and I'm sitting here looking for automation. There's no pollinators. So you look at Zach and you say, Go be a bee. Design a pollinator that can access the little stamens inside of the flowers, and then as a result, get more peppers than you know what to do with. Or this little science experiment where we grew one of the world's hottest peppers, the Carolina Reaper, in the same nutrient reservoir as some cherry tomatoes. And when those cherry tomatoes get older, and you pick the cherry tomato with your student, Sasha, and you both have one together, and you look at each other, and you immediately spit it on the floor because you just realized you created Carolina Reaper cherry tomatoes. That's an awesome failure right there, okay? And it's only something that you can learn from experimenting and from throwing different plants in the same system. And let's not forget to put the A in STEAM. When you teach a kid how to take a picture with a line of code, and you pair her with a young architect with a knack for CAD engineering. And they design together a 3D printed pan tilt time lapse uh, camera that was able to capture the perfect picture of our first cucumber flower. Now, here's Cami, named after my four year old engineer. But what she is here is our computerized agriculture monitoring interface. She's an amalgam of everything that we've done through two years of trial and error and making together. Not only can she observe and automate all of the variables within our system and give us a look at what they are from afar, anything with a connected internet device, she stands as a glaring example of what happens when you take the consumers of technology and turn them into true producers of it. When everything around these kids is smart, from doorbells to thermostats to what have you, how awesome is it to just open up the hood and let them take a peek and bust open the guts of these things and break it and screw it up and fix it all over again, and then next time decide, hey, maybe I'll make it myself. You know, I'm not as excited about what they're making now as I am about what they're gonna make next. Because my students don't show me what they know by writing down the equation for photosynthesis on a test. They make music videos about it. They host debates. They get to appreciate why stop motion advertising costs so much when they have to take a thousand pictures to produce a two minute project. They get to play games by designing farms in Minecraft. And even though I don't fully understand the whole thing, if you just lean into the Fortnite thing a bit, you have a kid make a public service announcement about farm-to-table agriculture in playground mode, you realize, damn, I would have missed that kid had I not just said yes to something that Mason wanted to try. 
And let's not forget why we did this to begin with, right? It was to make food that we could eat, bok choy that we can harvest and share together for Chinese New Year in our Mandarin classes, basil that we can clip out of our vertical garden and turn into sauce on our pizzas so that we could sit down together and share a meal, all while we get to know what photosynthesis is. Now, inevitably, I get asked all the time, how do you know, Chris? How can you prove that these kids are actually learning anything? And I tell you what, I will never point to a test grade or a report card or a transcript. That's what they want me to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to point to the digital portfolio that they've created for themselves, that they've chosen for themselves, that they've earned because we were willing to let them fail enough times to learn something real. Now, much like the scouts earn badges when they tie a knot or bait a hook, ours earn badges stocked with evidence and metadata that allow them to be an individual in a sea full of good test takers. And when the parents don't totally get it, when they're still not convinced, invite them in. Have them show up with their siblings and spend two hours making something for an evening with smiles on their face, screwing it up the entire way, and they realize it's not about the end, it's about the process. That we fail together and we learn together. And if I can leave you with one last note, and this is a quote I love, nothing diminishes anxiety faster than action. Don't wait until it's perfect because it's never going to be. Take the dive. It's going to make you commit to being a lifelong learner, you're going to have to stay ahead of your students' knowledge of technology, which is almost impossible. And you're going to have to accept the fact that a kid is going to teach you something. Because the day that that does not happen, there's too much restriction in place for way too long. So Mars farming is not just about cultivating food. It's about cultivating today's makers into tomorrow's problem solvers. And if you want to continue to follow their journey, or better yet, come along for the ride because it's going to be awesome, reach out for us. We're waiting and the water's warm. Thank you so much for your time tonight.